2003. Uh, his research interests include plant molecular genetics, genomics, and stress biology. He has published more than 150 research papers, reviews, book chapters, and highly cited reputed journals. I remember he was, uh, I think he is also, I don't know whether he is still there in the editorial board or not, uh, but he was uh, acting as an uh, editor, as an editor in various you know, international journals. For example, your DNA research, Expert Journal of Experimental Biology, uh, TAG, Trends in Plant Science. So, probably you have heard about that. Also, in uh, DMC Biology, Plus, Plant Science, Plant Cell Report, Plant Cell Tissue and Organ Culture. And uh, I have already given you this. You can look into the numbers of you know, prestigious awards and honors he has received in his, uh, so far. Uh, so, so he is very talented in the area of genomics, very hard working scientist, and very intelligent scientist. I uh, welcome Manoj again. Manoj? Yes. yes. So, Dr. Manoj is here. Uh, so, Dr. Manoj, over to you, you can start. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So, it is a nice meeting you all through this virtual platform on the occasion of this workshop come training on advanced biotechnological knowledge and skills for research and innovation organized by DBT, NECAB, Assam Agriculture University, Jorhat. And my foremost thanks are to the organizing committee chairman, uh, the workshop uh, conducting person, Dr. Sumita Acharji, for inviting me to deliver this talk among you people. As you know, the nation or the entire world is facing such a difficult situation due to the pandemic spread. But we prove that our academia is unstoppable and we keep organizing such online and hybrid mode programs to keep the scientific community engaged in active research and providing research updates. I appreciate the participants also, since you have gathered to prove that nothing can stop us from learning. And I hope this virtual public talk provides you an updated information on the roadmap for outcome-based education and research. Today, my topic uh, has relevance to the ongoing issue of hunger and malnutrition, as well as the important challenges and how we are going to feed the 10 billion people by the end of 2030. So basically today I'm going to talk about two uh, parts. One is to show you the challenge ahead of us, that is how we are going to feed the people. And the second part is uh, to, to the first question answer where I will show how mainstreaming the value addition to the bioresources and deploying the biotechnological tools will address food and nutritional security. So coming to this uh, topic, feeding the 10 billion, a genomics perspective. As you know, the humans are the last one to evolve on this earth, but we are leading the game in terms of number. As on yesterday, this time, our population count was 7.8 billion, and experts predict that it will reach 10 billion by 2030. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Manoj, your slides are not moving actually. No, now it's not. No, no, we can't see huh? any, any, any motion. It's not moving. Yeah, now it's moving. Put it in slideshow mode. Okay, do it in slideshow. No, but uh, in my place, it is showing the slideshow. Now I have made a slideshow. No, it's not happening. For some reason, it's not happening. It's all right for us, it's visible to us. So, either you can just uh, make the slides a little bit bigger, That's that will do. So, uh, I, I can do like this, then I have to increase the, this font. I think so. Even the font is all right for us, I think. Font size is all right for us. Okay, because now, uh, from my side, it was uh, now... Uh, it's a Wi-Fi issue. What you can so. Wi-Fi that is a problem. Uh, so maybe if I if I can switch off my video, then I think it will increase the bandwidth. Uh, no, it's okay. Just uh, make sure the slides are moving. Okay. Just move. So I will, I will move. Oh, it's not also moving, man. Uh huh. 
Sumita, can I can I uh, do once more? Log out and log in. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Richard, Richard, your audio system muted. Thanks, Richard. So uh, now I made it full screen. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Now, just, now it is moving. No, I am no. moving it. No. Slides are not moving. No. No. <coughs> slides are not moving. No. No. So well, then I think it is better to keep it like this. I will do now manually. Yeah, now it is moving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but this, I think this is the mode I have to work out. Yeah. Otherwise, I think. Yeah, it's better. Yes, That's okay. Nice. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, mm -hmm. sorry for the interruption. Um, as you know, the humans are the last one to evolve on this earth, uh, but we are leading the game in terms of number. As on yesterday, this time our population count was 7.8 billion, and uh, what experts predict that uh, by 2030 it will be 20, uh, 10 billion. So, to this population, we have assigned three things as their basic needs namely, food, shelter, and clothes. We have been told that without these three needs, survival of a human on this earth is not easy. But we, if we ask the whether this 7.8 billion gets the three basic needs, the answer is no. 821 million are still hungry. It means that one in 10 among us, every 10 seconds a child dies from hunger related causes. One in four of the world children suffer from malnutrition. So the global hunger, hunger index of 2019 shows that uh, the issue is very serious in, in, in case of uh, Africa and South Asia, including India. You can see here, the whole, the issue is very clear, serious. You can see the, the is extremely alarming, alarming, color-wise, serious, moderate, no. So, Africa and South Asia, including India, is in a very difficult position in terms of global hunger index of 2019 data. So, if you see the global hunger index score, uh, starting from 2000 to up to 2019, at the regional level, South Asia and Africa, South of Sahara, have the highest hunger score in the world. 
from 29 point, you can see here 29.3 to 28.4 respectively in South Asia and Africa south of Sahara. So the global report on food crisis, which was released in 2020, it shows that the number of these uh, acute food insecure people in the crisis is 135 million, which was divided across 55 countries and territories. And out of these 821 people go to bed hungry every night all over the world. And at the new global report and food crisis shows, there are a further 135 million people facing crisis level of hunger and and the situation is worse. So this data is before the COVID-19. <laughs> so you can see uh, after COVID-19, what will be the situation? It, it is really serious. So the effect of food insecurity among children, the children are the most affected one. We are still far from world without malnutrition. This is the joint child malnutrition estimate. 2020 data shows that 144 million children under the age of five are stunted means they are too short for their age. 47 million children under the five are wasted, that means too thin for their weight. And 38 million children under the age of five are overweight. So you can see that uh, this malnutrition has severe effect on the children, mostly affected by the children. And if you see the percentage of stunted children under the age of group of five by uh, this uh, uh, joint child malnutrition estimates 2020, 55.9 million children from South Asia are, are most affected. 25.2 million children from South Asia are too thin. So keeping in view uh, this problem, the United Nations uh, has uh, uh, designated 17 sustainable development goals. And out of these 17 sustainable goals in this slide, number one, two, and three directly related to food. So, so see that importance of food. So out of 17 sustainable development goals, three, first three are related to food. When it comes to food, uh, I want to show you one issue that uh, the, uh, the world checklist of vascular plant in the largest botanical garden Q in UK, they have estimated more than 11 lakhs of vascular plants are present in the earth. And out of this 11 lakh 28,000 uh, for crops used for, for food by humans throughout the history is 7,000. So, out of 11 lakhs vascular plant, 7,000 has been used as a food by the uh, humans uh, earlier. But if you see the current situation, you will find that we are confined to the only three crops, rice, wheat, and maize, which provide 50% of the world food consumption. And along with these three, there are five animals, and it cons consists of 75% of the world food. So the food base is narrowing down from 11 lakh to 7,000. Now we are cutting only 15, including five animals. So it's a, it's a very serious concern. So that's the region I, I had depicted here that this, there is a great imbalance. How to feed that 7.8 billion with these 15 species? So there is a huge gap between the population and the number of crop species available to feed the population. Okay, so we have 11 lakh vascular plant. Earlier ancestor of ours, they have used 7,000. And now we are using only 15. But out of these 15, three are the major cereals, rice, wheat, and maize, and and rest is the animals. So now it's high time to focus on mainstreaming the underutilized crops for food and nutritional security and how we can utilize the next generation genomics tools for trade improvement in this crop. So if you see what is the neglected underutilized crops, neglected underutilized crop means that neglected means less research attention has been made, underutilized means marginally cultivated and used. 
So in terms of neglected and underutilized under crops, there are different categories. It comes under tubers, legumes, leafy vegetables, and minor millets. And what are the characteristics of this neglected underutilized species? They are marginally grown and they are adapted to the marginal environment. They are highly nutritious. I will show you some data. NUS have potential for development as novel consumer product. As you can see in the market, you will get all sorts of ragi, biscuit, and other th stuff. <coughs> NUS are typically embedded within the local traditional culture. If you still go into the remote areas of uh, any state, you will find that uh, the farmers are still growing this, uh, uh, these uh, neglected crops for their own consumption. So coming to the example of this, uh, as I said, that there I have chosen only four out of these, several are there. So coming to the tubers example, taro, arrowroot, Indian shoot, canola, purple yam, air potato, and elephant food. They are highly nutritious. Coming to the example of legumes, we have several high, highly nutritious legumes like wing bean, jack bean, Bambara groundnut, kidney bean, kava bean, lima bean, cow pea, horse gram, rice bean, velvet bean, and ajushi bean. Coming to the smaller minor millet, we have finger millet, foxton millet, proso millet, little millet, barnard millet, teff, odo millet, phonio, job steer, guinea millet, and brown stock millet. So these all four different classes I have shown today, they are highly nutritious. <coughs> Coming to my own example, what uh, we are doing in the one of the millet is Foxton millet. So uh, if you see the statewide estimate production of this millet, uh, Rajasthan and Maharashtra, they are uh, producing more uh, millets in terms of area wise. But production wise, uh, Tamil Nadu and Uttarakhand are in the top. If you see the uh, history that was recently published in Nature Plant uh, regarding the uh, the origin of this uh, comparison of the origin of rice and millets, it was shown that uh, the millets are already existed in the in the in the, in the world, and and rice came later. And now it was depicted that four thousand years ago the rice has been inducted in the uh, food chain. But before that, uh, these millets are already consumed by the uh, humans. Coming to the nutrition potential of this millet, uh, in terms of 100 grain of uh, grain, uh, grain, in terms of protein, fat, as food fiber, carbohydrate, energy, vitamins like thiamine and riboflavin. So millet are three to five times rich in all this uh, composition as compared to rice and wheat. So data also uh, predicted like this. So we have done this in 2016 when we compare, and then uh, we showed that there all the millets are three to five times more nutritious as compared to rice and wheat. Yeah, when we talk about the micronutrient in terms of potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, still three to five times more uh, uh, superior as compared to wheat and rice. So millets are now growing gaining the popularity. If you see the media reports, uh, one kilogram of Barnian millet, uh, which was produced in, uh, in the Tamil Nadu Madurai district, it was uh, the farmer fetch 110 rupees per kg. So uh, they are highly priced because the, uh, the production is less and the demand market demand is more. And the farmers are nowadays, they are selling it to the, uh, expo uh, exporting it to the, uh, uh, to the European and the American uh, countries because they are getting very high value of price. And, and you get all these product or millet product like millet, uh, the Barnian millet biryani, mill, uh, the ragi dosa, and, and also the cornflakes and other uh, 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 in the breakfast menu, all these things are available for uh, millet. Because the millets are good for the type 2 diabetic people, because the glycemic index of millet is less than 40, where rice has more than 50 and uh, 60 plus. So, what is the beauty of this millet? That this all the millet consists of a good resistant starch, and due to presence of this good resistant starch, when uh, humans use this millet as a carbohydrate, 
the conversion of carbohydrate to glucose is very slow due to presence of good resistance starch in the millet crop and that's why the conversion is slow from carbohydrate to glucose and that's why the glucose get time to get infused in the blood system but when you take it a uh, rice due to high glycemic index the carbohydrate consumed as rice it quickly convert into glucose and transfuse into the blood and that's the reason the blood sugar increased so that is the difference and beauty of eating millets as compared to other staple crops so good for that type 2 diabetic people so keeping in view the importance of this uh, millet crops the government of india through gadget notification it was published 13th april and 2018 they turned all these millets what i have shown you in the previous slide the all the 10 millets they have put it as a nutri cereals for production consumption and trade point of view and in a similar line the food and agriculture organization of united nation declared the year 2023 is an international year of millet so see the whatever we are doing it was really important for the <coughs> hunger point of view or malnutrition point of view so coming to the main question can millet address the hunger issue or ever growing population so this uh, slide shows the integrated map of hunger hotspots spanning 55 countries so these are the 55 countries uh, africa and and south of asia including india okay and uh, uh, this is the 2020 uh, data and the and the production of small millet in this region and this is the actual food insecure population color wise it was given so what is the way forward for this what is the uh, road map for this so we have to identify the millet species suitable for contribution of this in the hunger hotspot so first we have to identify the species because there are 10 millets so we cannot cultivate all the 10 millets in each and every environment so based on the environmental speciality we have to choose the millet like as i said that bandian millet is very well grown as far as the yield is concerned in in tamil nadu so farmers prefer to grow banned millet in tamil nadu states of india similarly in uttarakhand production wise they are very good as compared to the other states like tamil nadu but they use fox tail millet and finger millet ragi because that is suitable for the uttarakhand uh, cold climate and then followed by identification of the millet species suitable for cultivation we have to devise and optimization of the cultivation practice and training of farmers for millet cultivation although the older farmers they do not require any kind of uh, this uh, training but the new generation they required because they have never seen these crops earlier and that's the reason we have to devise some uh, cultivation practice then we have to implement this thing the large scale production of millet species and optimization of downstream processing if you produce crop but if you supply chain is not good then it is very difficult to put it into the market and most importantly genetic improvement of millet variety using modern biotechnological and breeding approach because as i said they are neglected under plus crop less research has been done for these crops because mainly research has done on rice wheat maize in these crops but very less research has done if you were you will get very few labs working on the genetic improvement of millets we are one of the lab that we also work in this direction and then as i said the supply chain devising appropriate strategy for post harvest processing storage and supply chain so if you want to know more about this uh, road map you can uh, read our uh, opinion article published in trends in plants and small millets for enduring food security and its pandemic so this is just uh, one story i have to uh, talked about but there is a big threat to agriculture it's on its way so covid 19 you have seen these are recession is another and the population bust you can see 10 billion people to feed <coughs> so what is the answer the answer is that next generation genomics tool for trade improvement in this crop so this is the only way we can increase our productivity by using the modern 
uh, genomics and biotechnological tools. Breeding is very slow. Before this NGS, uh, all the variety, whatever has been developed in, uh, in, in uh, cereals or in legumes, they are all done by the breeding. So one of the classical examples of IR8, this is a semi dwarf with good yield, was developed by crossing and PETA, Indonesian tall variety and low yield, with DGU gene. This is a Chinese dwarf variety with nominal yield. So this IR8 through recombinant inbuilt population was developed as a semi dwarf and good yield. Because if the planical is, if the plant, the rice plant is more height, then there is a problem of logic. So that's why farmers prefer semi dwarf variety so that with good panicle structure so that the yield is also uh, cannot be compromised and and it will not lodge during wind. So it looks uh, it took several years to release this IR8 to circumvent the FMI. The another example is this uh, uh, release of Super Anigeri 1 took 10 years of breeding approach to develop a wilt tolerant super anigiri uh, uh, rice variety. Similarly, uh, the Ikrisat people and ICR people, they have developed uh, the chickpea and uh, that desi uh, uh, variety of chickpea. Now, they, uh, there are two types, uh, types of uh, that uh, legumes that is a uh, the kabuli and desi. So chickpea is our desi uh, uh, chana and kabuli is the white one and the bigger. So now they have through Billy, they have developed a uh, medium size, uh, not like uh, uh, kabuli, but uh, similar to that, uh, the desi has been, they changed the color. Uh, white is always looks better because our desi chana is always, uh, you will see brownies and blackies. So color was not good. Uh, people doesn't, consumer doesn't prefer that. So the color has been changed and the size has also been increased um, to, by using these genomics uh, tools. So now the question is why we need to expedite the crop improvement program. Climate is changing very fast because you know that uh, uh, in Delhi, in the end of March, we have 40 degree. Can you believe in March 40 degree? So, what we are expecting this time that it will cross 50 in Delhi. So, the report finds that uh, uh, that the inland region are much, much in danger due to high temperature rise uh, when we compared with the coastal and hilly region. Coastal and hilly region are relieved because they, uh, they have a cold wind and, and, and also rain is there. But in the inland region, here in the middle of the or the whole this area is in danger due to increased heat. heat. And crop failure is due to climate change is very fast because sometimes we, we, we get no rain, sometimes we get late monsoon, sometimes we have flooding, some, sometimes we have pest and insect attack. I will show you one slide. There are several other diseases also there. And top of this, other natural calamities. So since uh, it is not in slide mode, it will not. So recently we have in, uh, seen a pest attack from uh, Pakistan in the state of uh, Rajasthan and Punjab. The whole crop was devastated by this pest attack, which came from Pakistan. So these are natural calamities. You cannot uh, predict. So, if you see the FAO data, uh, 2018, and drought is one of the main culprit out of all these stresses, 83%, followed by volcano eruption, storm, flood, tsunami, and earthquake. So, these uh, Economic Times uh, recently uh, uh, reported that the National Crime uh, Report Bureau data so that more than 42,000 farmers and daily wages commit suicide in 2019. This is data was before the COVID-19 incidents. So, think about it. Before COVID-19, more than 42,000 farmers and daily wages commit suicide. Why? Because due to this problem, I have shown you the, the stresses. And when all the farmers are gone, then it will be our turn. So if we don't address the question, and this uh, slide, uh, this big, uh, uh, table shows the statewide 
uh, statistics of death from uh, Maharashtra is the highest, and this is the farmers, and this is the uh, daily wage laborers. So this will continue until unless we address. So what is FAO predicted that 20 by 2050, the crop yield will decrease by 25% if you don't address the climate change issue now. So can biotechnology rescue agriculture? The answer is yes. What are the stresses? I have already told you that uh, abiotic stresses like uh, uh, flood, drought, heat, cold. And what are the biotechnical intervention like genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, ionomics, phenomics. So these are the different biotechnological in intervention to circumvent this. So now coming to the main thing. So if, if you see that some of the plants gave more yield, some of the plant gave less yield. And how we will use the biotechnological tools to answer this question? So first, we have to identify the gene or locus which is responsible for the high yield of the plant. And this is the additional sequence. Uh, for that region, uh, the plant is giving more yield. So can we transfer this gene from high yielding plant to the low yielding plant? Yes, the answer is yes. And how? Through genetic engineering. So before I go into this uh, genetic engineering thing, that uh, DNA sequencing has revolutionized the crop improvement program because now you can, you can now you can see that most of the crops in 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 use human use they have been sequenced. If we talk about rice, wheat, maize, sorghum, any name you uh, chickpea, kabuli. So all these crops, those were used by the humans, they have been sequenced. And what is the beauty of the sequence? To identify the candidate genes. And once you do the sequencing, you get such kind of noise, ATGC, whether it is animal or plant, doesn't matter. You will get ATGC. And then we have to make sense out of this sequence, ATGC. So this red color one, the genes encoded for proteins and this motifs, regulatory motifs controls the gene expression. This is the green, uh, signal. You can see here the green is up regulated, red is down regulated. So this is the traffic signal kind of thing. They regulate the, the motifs, regulate the expression of the gene. So as I said that we have identified a, uh, a high yielding gene. Now we want to transfer it to the low yielding gene because the low yielding uh, plant is disease resistance. So we want to make the low yielding plant which is disease resistant to high yielding plant because it is advantageous since it has a disease resistance. So we, ha we have identified the gene or locus. We have, the, we have to clone it in a vector and then we have to put it in the X plant and then we subsequently raise through tissue culture the uh, plants and that plants will contain the higher yield gene and it will produce the higher yield. So this is the very simplified way so that a layman can also understand. Now there are different methods for this uh, transfer of gene and the, the source of this gene from any source. It can be bacteria, it can be virus, it can be plant, animal, anywhere. It has to be cloned in a vector and prove the vector plasmid into agrobacterium TB faciens and callus will form and then subsequently you can generate the transgenic plant. So Bt is one of the good example of success of this uh, genetic engineering. So worms and insects feed the vegetable parts. You have seen in the market or in the home also, when a mother or uh, your uh, sister cuts the uh, brinjal, you will find this kind of picture. And for this is the representative picture for all the crops. So how this BT has come into picture? BT is basically Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, basically is the bacteria, which kills, which has the property to kill the insect. And how it do this? Because this is the structure of the BT gene, uh, when a Bacillus thuringiensis bacteria. And this BT toxin crystal is the 
master my master uh, uh, protein that used for the killing of this insect so when the plant was transferred with this bt toxin crystal when the insect eat the leaf of that bt transgenic plant and this bt toxin dissolve in the gut cell of this insect which consists a high ph and then it make a pore or hole in the gut cell of the insect and due to this pore and hole the insect cannot survive and it starves and death so this is the way that bt toxin crystal has been used from bacteria to answer the question of uh, the pest and worm attack in plant so this how this has been done that bt toxin crystal is known as properly known as trigene it has been found in a plasmid vector through agrobacterium transformation it was, has been transferred and through callus and subsequent uh, tissue culture we uh, develop this uh, bt uh, gene containing transgenic plants <laughs> So this is the classical example of uh, non-BT and BT vision. So this is non-BT. You can see here the insect and the, the damage. But when uh, the BT gene has been put, it was uh, absolutely fine. No, no disease. Uh, BT cotton, non-BT cotton, similarly non-BT corn and BT corn. So these are the advantage of how this BT gene from bacteria helps in the rescue of the human uh, uh, civilization. So now I am going to give you one example of plant to plant gene transfer. The earlier example was from bacteria to plant. Now it is plant to plant. So we work uh, you know, on a crop that is foxtail millet. It is a diploid. And this genome has been sequenced by two in, uh, group. One is American group, another is the Chinese group in, in the year 2012. Mm -hmm. And once we receive the public domain data, then we compare this uh, millet sequences uh, with sorghum and maize because they are the related one. And through this geo annotation, 586 gene out of 1517, which is specific to this Foxton millet, not present in sorghum and maize. Out of this 1517, 586 gene were functionally annotated to water responsive. And and for that 586, we have chosen five genes. For example, HSP, HSOC protein, aquaporin, mu transcription factor, Wargi transcription factor, and ADP ribosylation factor. <laughs> so I will show you one simplified story of uh, a small HSOC protein 27. So a small HSOC protein 20, uh, there are 113 genes of uh, HSOC protein in, in Fox 10 million. And uh, you cannot characterize 113 genes. So what we did, we through expression study, we found that uh, this HSP27 gene was highly expressed in all the abiotic stress conditions. This is a single HSP27, this is 650 base pair in length. It was expressed in uh, drought, salinity, cold, and heat. And when we checked the uh, phylogeny, we found that this small hits of 27 uh, protein is only present in C4 panicoid species, not in C3 plants. So rice is C3, wheat is C3. So the, when we compare the sequence and through PCR, we confirm that this foxtail millet small hits of protein 27 is only present in C4 panicoid crops, not in any of the C3. So what we did, we used this HSP27 foxtail millet gene. We transform this gene into the IR64 of rice variety. So we develop a T3 transgenic rice lines of Boston <coughs> millet uh, HSP27. And this is the picture. You can see the wild type without HSP27. And this is the uh, Boston <laughs> millet HSP27. They are happily growing and they're good. So HSP27 gene of Foxton millet expressed in rice and the transgenic rice lines showed enhanced tolerance to heat stress as well as improve agronomic traits <coughs> such as plant height, dillon number, panicle number, size, number of seeds per panicle. <coughs> and how this uh, gene is working, HSP is a uh, of protein, it is, works as a molecular chaperone. So what is the molecular chaperone? When heat was generated in the environment, this HSP, they are not degrading. 
normal protein can decrease denature due to extreme heat but hsp at 27 in extreme heat it binds to the other protein to prevent its degradation and that's the reason the plant containing hsp 27 in extreme heat 50 degree temperature constant temperature it do the normal function when we do the physiological and biochemical assay of the enzymatic assay we we found that when uh, it, this uh, uh, hsp 27 uh, after heating a uh, subsequent heating of uh, 30 40 50 and when it comes to the uh, normal temperature room temperature 25 it regains is enzymatic activity up to 60% so that is the beauty of molecular chaperons that when the uh, extreme heat it retains it doesn't degrade or doesn't denaturate due to its own uh, property binding with other protein and when it comes to the normal temperature room temperature or favorable condition it regains its enzymatic activity up to 60% we have shown for hsp 27 and that is the reason on the plants harboring this uh, having this hsp 27 survive in the environment so as i said that 113 hsp gene are there we cannot characterize 113 so we have developed indicated pipeline for that these are all in silico and then we over express some of the candidate gene based on the expression profiling in different abiotic stresses in each system to whether this gene whatever is differentially expressed in all the abiotic stresses a uh, four or five and then we check the over expression in the heterologous system in yeast and to finally characterize whether which one we have to select for further characterization and by this way we have identified 124 uh, c2s2 type of gene finger transcription factor and we have characterized one similarly 110 gene for work transcription factors 23 for uh, rice adp ribosylation factor and 25 genes for fox10 millet adp ribosylation factor <laughs> Now coming to the biotechnological different biotechnological approaches are available for fine tune the gene like hsp27 i have shown you the over expression it means that you are over producing a target protein that is either not present or present but not in sufficient amount and you can do this through by using own promoter or constituent promoter so this is called over expression that is the i have shown you in uh, uh, boxed millet hsp27 in rice there is another called is rnai rna interference if you want to silence the target of the protein like uh, in foxtel millet uh, to to know the function of hsp27 if we silence this gene in uh, through rnai approach in uh, in in tolerant variety of foxtel millet so it should be susceptible to heat for that so uh, this is the counter evidence the so if you show some gene through over expression you have to also can show by uh, by uh, silencing that gene also and the new technique is crispr cas9 so if you want to mutate at the target site so if you want to mutate a particular amino acid or uh, a base addition or deletion you can use that crispr cas9 approach so this is uh, uh, another example of this autophagy gene siatgf it was over expressed in rice which confer tolerance to nitrogen starvation so if you see the wild type of rice and uh, uh, and the over expressed atg8a in the transgenic uh, lines it actually conferred tolerance to nitrogen starvation so this slide shows the basically the one single gene uh, that is acetyl italica asr4 abscisic acid stress and ripening induced this was over expressed in drought and then and also rnai approach so the same gene was used for drought and salinity and through over expression and rnai approach so if you see that this is the drought stress this is the control before treatment drought treatment was given for 10 days and this is the recovery drought 13 day and recovered in the 5 day so once this gene asr4 you can see here the over expression lines rice lines they are growing better 
where when we silence this gene, the RNAi line, the same gene, the plant dies. So it shows that yes, this gene is doing the function related to drought. Similarly for salinity also, uh, this is the overexpression. If you see the control plant and the uh, uh, the transgenic overexpression plant, they are at least surviving. When we do the silencing of this gene in the in the in the salinity, uh, you can see here that plant dies. So this shows that once we overexpress the gene and similar at the same time when we silence these genes, it dies. So there are two different uh, techniques that knock down and knock out. I have showed you RNAi and CRISPR. So RNAi, a virus inducing gene silencing is knocked down, whereas CRISPR is knock out. I will show you how it works. So no, RNA to uh, knock down. So there is a one single BAHD gene in Cytadia viridis which causes large stable decrease in cell wall, ferrularization, and increase in biomass digestibility. So this uh, BASD gene in Citaria uh, viridis, uh, when uh, it was down-regulated, actually, RN through RNAIs, so it enhanced the digestibility of the plant for animal feed production purpose. So single gene, when we down-regulate, it increases the digestibility of the plant for animal feed feed purpose. Now coming to another approach of knockdown is virus induced gene silencing. What is virus induced gene silencing? Fooling a plant to degrade its own RNA. So if you see, uh, if you want to know uh, that function of a particular gene uh, for any candidate gene, you can use this virus induced gene silencing approach. So this is a transient approach. Overexpression is a transgenic approach. So Trans, uh, transiently, you can also uh, try to fun uh, find out the function of a gene through virus into gene silencing. Okay, so what uh, uh, scientists are doing that uh, this blue color in the plant gene is interested. You want to know the function. So you have to clone this gene in the VIX vector, virus into gene silencing vector. There are different kinds of VIX vector, TRB, BMB, BSAB. So this VIX vector was <laughs> was cloned in a uh, this plant uh, dna was cloned in the vix vector and then through dcl and rbb they make this single standard to uh, double standard sina 21 to 22 nucleotide and when risk and agio complex comes the plant is unable to identify its own dna in cuts and that's the reason you get the mutation so you cut the gene the plant cuts its own gene since we have make him full because it was cloned in a VIX uh, uh, RNA, uh, viral RNA. So it, it doesn't identify its own DNA and, it, uh, and cuts its own DNA. And that's the reason we can uh, silence that particular plant gene by using the VIX vector. So coming to the knockout uh, CRISPR uh, uh, thing. So CRISPR uh, basically has that... Uh, 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 two component. One is the single guide RNA uh, that is customizable, and the second one is the Cas9 endonuclease. So guide RNA is very important. So the gene you want to edit, so you have to prepare or make a guide RNA sequence which matches the target gene of a genomic sequence. So if this is your uh, uh, genomic sequence DNA, you have to make a guide RNA which is complementary to the your gene of interest, target gene of interest, where you want to do editing. And Cas9 uh, is an uh, endonuclease which are associated with the guide RNA, which helps the guide RNA to reach its place, and it cuts in the, uh, in the, in the uh, DNA sequence. So, so guide RNA sequence direct the endonuclease to DNA region, which is aimed for the targeting, where you want to do the editing. Cas9 assembly bites the target gene because I have not in a full, uh, full screen mode. That's the reason it was not animated. Otherwise, it is an animated slide. Anyway, so nucleus cuts uh, Cas9 cuts the DNA, uh, and and there is a then and the repair because once it is cut, then usually DNA repair will happen. And there are two types of DNA repair actually. One is the 
homology directed repair and as the, another is the non homologous end joining a non homologous end joining is very important it's a error prone repair leads to insertion or deletion at the target site so guide rna where do you want to make the uh, editing and cas 914 which helps the uh, guide rna to locate its position and cut it the cas 9 act as the endonuclease as a scissor and then the dna repair happens either through homology direct repair or non homologous repair so alteration in a single or multiple base or insertion or deletion of short sequences is responsible for altered agronomic traits among the different population or even in the genus so if you want to edit any of the target dna sequence you can use this crispr cas9 technology so uh, coming to the overview of the side directed nu uh, nucleus technique so this is the overview of simplified way how sdn1 sdn2 and sdn3 work so so side directed nucleus editing involves enzyme complexes that recognize the specific dna sequence in the genome and cleaves them so this is the basically the structure of the uh, the uh, the dna actually this is the plant dna and this uh, blue uh, green color is the dna binding domain and this yellow color is the nucleus domain okay and there are different four different uh, categories of this kind of enzyme one is that uh, mutagenesis another is the zinc finger nucleus another is the transcription activator like effector nucleus another is the as i said in before this slide cluster regulatory instruments for short pandemic repeat palindromic repeats so these are basically used for side directed nucleases to cut to insertion actually in the uh, plant dna and in sdn1 it produces a double stranded break in the genome without adding any foreign dna so this is very important sdn1 and sdn2 they are not adding any foreign dna but sdn3 you can add foreign dna or any other source of dna so that is the reason uh, why uh, in a recent notification uh, government of india uh, exempted the sdn1 and sdn2 genoweighted lines are not considered as a gm plant gen uh, genetic uh, uh, engineer plant so finally some good news uh, for the plant biologist since that uh, transgenic plants has not been approved by the uh, grc so but if somebody develop any crispr edited line by using the uh, uh, sdn1 or sdn2 where you only editing the single nucleotide or addition or deletion not introducing any foreign dna which is done for sdn3 so sdn1 and sdn2 are not falling under the category from the previous rules 1989 that is not to be considered as a gm crop so this is happened due to the constant uh, actually as uh, pressure from the scientist and good wishes from the other people well wishers and it is very important that india is fortunate that at least this genome editing technology sdn1 sdn2 has been approved and not considered as a transgenic uh, crop so this will help not only india but also many other developing countries in asia sub saharan africa and south africa america for harnessing the fruits of gene, uh, gene editing so i will show you a few example of this gene editing so how crispr cas9 prevent the pre harvest sprouting a major issue in wheat so pre harvest sprouting you know what is this when the grain of wheat was mature in the field if there is some rain occurs so those who are susceptible to pre harvest sprouting the grain germinate within the plant and by this way it causes serious decrease in grain quality and yield due to pre harvest sprouting so what scientists has done that uh, as you know that uh, the bread wheat that the floor uh, wheat floor we are eating they uh, this is hexaploid it consists of three genome a b and d so if you want to modify anything in 
<laughs> any of the genes, you have to do it all the three genomes. You have to do it in the A genome, B genome, and B genome. <laughs> so this is the gene QSD1 encodes for allylene aminotransferase family member. So what scientists has been done that they have mutating this allylene aminotransferase gene. This is the structure of this allylene aminotransferase gene in A, B, and D genome. Okay, so they have developed a triple knockout mutant in the A, B, and D genome. So they have added ATT in the A genome, B genome, and D genome of this <laughs> allylene aminotransferase and arrested the pre-harvest sprouting in the uh, edited plants. So this is the beauty of this technology. You can see that mutating a single gene, triticum estivum, allylene aminotransferase through CRISPR arrested the pre-harvest sprouting torrents in wheat. Similarly, another good example I will show you, de novo domestication. Tomato we will all eat in every day, either in a salad or in, in the, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a vegetable. So this is Solanum pimpilifolium. So Solanum pimpilifolium, all the wilds have a very small size of fruit. This is pea-sized fruit, but they are very stress tolerant, resistance. All the wild are stress resistance and also has indeterminate growth. So what scientists has done that they have through CRISPR-Cas9 technology, they have edited six gene of this uh, pimpinifolium of tomato. And when they edited the six gene, what are the six gene the, for uh, plant growth habit? Self-pruning. There is one gene for plant growth habit, like I have shown you here, indeterminate growth. If you edit this gene, you will get a determinate growth. Fruit cell, plant size, ovate gene and faciated gene, fruit weight 2.2. These are the two genes from fruit size and this is ovate is the fruit cell. So you can see the P size to a bigger size. And then fruit number, multiflora gene. So here you will get very few fruit in uh, wild type, but here you will get much more fruit when we edit this uh, fruit number gene, multiflora. Nutrition quality gene, lycopene beta cyclase. They have edited this gene in the uh, in the wild type, and 500 percent of high lycopene was developed in the CRISPR edited line. So they have transformed this wild variety of Solanum pimpinifolium tomato to domesticated Solanum pimpinifolium. So this is the power of this technology. So editing six gene, you make a plant from wild to cultivated, domesticated. So this is the conclusion of the total talk today, what I have talked to you, that molecular breeding and genetic manipulation have emerged as the two most potent technologies of crop improvement. Advances in next generation sequencing technology have enabled the incorporation of genomics with various disciplines of crop breeding. Functional and comparative genomics have provided the platform for gene discovery and their functional characterization. The key gene or genus, genes regulating a molecular pathway are being genetically engineered or edited to develop phenotypically improved crop lines. Collaborative and concerted research is required to circumvent the global challenge to feed that 10 billion by 2030. It was wrongly written 2050, this 2030. So this slide shows the importance that what this NGS technology and biotechnical tool can do is a, uh, actually basically revolutionize the whole agricultural system. <laughs> so this is basically for this uh, student that uh, what I am today due to this uh, achievement of my students. Until uh, that, I think I have guided 15 PhD student and uh, the, one of the first student, Charu Lata, she is now scientist. Uh, in NBI Lucknow, I CSR Institute. She catches the drip transcription factor, which is conferring drought risk in foxtail millet. She got all the awards and I, I think INSA medal for young scientist, NASI young scientist medal. Her thesis was awarded Joel Anil, outstanding doctoral thesis from ICAR, and then Sir Woven Excellence Awardee, Inspire Faculty Award. So whatever is required. Uh, available for her age groups, she got everything. Mm -hmm. Similarly, to 
got everything like Charu and Muthu was also instrumental in developing the genomic resources. This is very important for any underutilized crop that you have to develop the genomic resources. Without these genomic resources, we cannot do the crop improvement. So he developed the genomic resources in Fox Terminate in terms of different kinds of molecular marker like SSR marker, microsatellite, internal line polymorphic marker, transposable element based marker, micro RNA based marker. And he has developed four different databases because once the resources has been developed, it should be used, make use of freely to the public so that other people can also use it. Until unless if you do something and publish it, that's all. But this is not the way you can do. So whatever resources you develop, it should be open publicly, it should be available to the entire scientific community. So we have developed four databases in terms of all these markers and comparative mapping things for Fox Terminate and it is available in with a comparative mapping tool also we have uh, uh, put there in the database so that if somebody wants to check how much uh, centene or uh, is there uh, with Fox Terminate rice, wheat, maize and sorghum. These four crops has been included in the database also. Uh, how this uh, characterize the WD40 protein, which con confer for abiotic stress tolerance. He got this uh, Brave scholarship. Uh, so this and 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 and, and uh, Swati characterized the NAC transcription factor for conferring serenity tolerance in Fox millet. And for his work, her works, he got the Mary Curie fellowship. So this is the story from Fox millet group. I have also worked in another uh, crop. Uh, uh, this is tomato. And there uh, we want to find out uh, the uh, molecular mass mechanism um, for disease resistance. And for that, we work on a, a notorious virus. This is tomato leaf curl virus. And uh, it was once it attacked and uh, the 100% yield loss is there. So we try to understand or characterize a few microRNA, those who are responsible for providing resistance for the plant against this virus. And if we got input is all pathways change like RPT4, Pranav has characterized, is uh, showed that how RPT4 <laughs> uh, has a role in uh, defense pathway against this tomato leaf carnitine virus infection. And Namisha um, uh, have identified a microRNA 159, which uh, uh, coupling with this target MIP33, and in the downstream, it binds to the origin SW5 and <laughs> conferring. Uh, resistant to the uh, uh, plant against this tomato leaf the virus and she has uh, during her phd she has published a paper in proceeding of national academy of sciences usa pns so uh, you can see that uh, these are the uh, contribution from the student and last but not least uh, this is the team uh, I put always the girls or women at the front and they are the driving force in our lab and we follow them. So thank you very much. And the funding from uh, Department of Biotechnology, mostly 90% and you are from other sources also. Thank you very much. Hello, sir. Good morning, sir. Sir, I am Kailash Patel good from morning, morning. I am CPS. Uh, sir, your lecture is so informative, but I have sir, one query. Sir, yes, actually, tell me. I am a pathologist. Sir, I am doing my MS in plant pathology. So one, sir, you told that in chickpea for wilt, you are just uh, transferring the sequence from the uh, healthy means which have the resistance. That's it. so. Can it? Uh, uh, is it possible from uh, for uh, a complex disease like if one or two pathogen can involve? So can we transfer more than one gene sequence in a, another host? Yes, this is called gene pyramiding. Okay, so we have okay. identified one resistant gene which has five paralogs in tomato. Uh, that is SW5, uh, A, B, C, D, E. But uh, our gene, uh, resistant gene SW5A, uh, 
uh, is uh, providing resistance against the DNA virus. Its one paralog is SW5B, which is giving resistance against the RNA virus. So, if we want to make a plant with broad uh, resistance against uh, DNA and RNA virus, then we have to make a gene pyramiding of both the uh, gene, like uh, the paralox, like uh, SW5A and B, so that the plant harboring this A and B can provide resistance against both DNA and RNA virus. So, it's possible, yes. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank breeding, you, sir. Breeding also is possible. Breeding also, there are several blast resistant gene has been pyramided in the uh, uh, in the cultivated rice varieties. There are several examples are there. Gene pyramiding. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Have come a little bit forward. Yes, yes, now, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, indeed, it was a very good seminar. Huh? You can switch on your video again. Okay? Oh, then I have to, because that, due to okay. bandwidth, I have, I am, I am, I am, Okay, sir, may I have a question? Yes, yeah, yeah. Ask. Yeah, sir, you have mentioned about HSP27 gene uh, uh, in foxtail, which you have incorporated into the rice. Uh -huh. And as it shows uh, many factors like uh, in salinity, cold, and heat, and uh, you have mentioned about heat. Whenever there is a heat above a particular temperature, this binds with a particular protein and uh, it uh, prevents the degradation. So, so uh, in currently rice, the spike fertility rate and spike fertility rate decreases uh, within a temperature um, to 12 to 20 degrees Celsius. So. What is the role of HSP27 uh, at that particular temperature in rice as you have incorporated in rice for cold? No, we have checked only the uh, heat against uh, 50 degrees. So we have mimicked the uh, condi environmental condition in the plant growth chamber, uh, what is present uh, from uh, morning to night, the whole 24 into 7. And it, this experiment was done for uh, uh, 15 days, actually, uh, mimicking the environmental condition to the growth chamber for rice. So in the morning, it was uh, starting from 24. It was raising 26, 28 for every three, four hours or five hours interval. So it reaches up to from uh, uh, 12 noon to uh, uh, 2 p.m. Two hours we have given 50 degree stress it was the environmental uh, temperature condition we have and when uh, we check the physiological uh, parameters of this transgenic rice plant harboring this ssp27 uh, we found that uh, the photosynthetic efficiency was better as compared to the wild type the other agronomic uh, traits are uh, much, much uh, superior as compared to the uh, wild plant. And the yield, when we check, we found that 70% of the yield loss is there in the wild, whereas it here in the transgenic, 30% only yield loss. So the transgenic plant, rice plant, harboring this uh, fox terminate HSP27 is performing better in terms of uh, uh, yield and stress parameters. But for stress, we have only checked the heat not other stress, cold and salinity we have not checked. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, you can ask here. Sir, I have a question. Said, uh, in one of the slides that you have mentioned about the plans for gene family analysis. In that analysis, sir, you have mentioned about the gene structure analysis. And uh, my question is that how to uh, perform this gene structure analysis and what type of information can we get from that analysis? No, I, I didn't hear properly the question you asked. Can you repeat once? Yes, sir. Sir, in, in one of your slides, uh, uh, saying that the pipeline for gene structure analysis. In the gene slide, structure? Uh, gene structure analysis. Then my question is uh, how to perform the gene structure analysis and what are, what are the information that can we get from that analysis? 
so uh, there are several free of online uh, program is available in the in the in the internet so you can use for gene uh, structure uh, analysis there are several like promote analysis there are several uh, softwares are there mm -hmm. similarly for the uh, downstream uh, sequence analysis there are several free uh, softwares are there mm -hmm. if you if you if you use those software, he is talking about gene structure analysis. So, like, if you want to do promoter analysis, you can find out uh, where, 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 where the transcription factor binds, which are the sequences. So, those kind of things you can do. Those kind of information you can also do. Okay. So, I have shown you the pipeline that how to uh, analyze the uh, gene family. And from there, you uh, can choose based on the expression profiling of the uh, genes that which one you want to finally you want to characterize. So for example, I have shown you HSP27. It was differentially expressed in all the four uh, abiotic stresses, not other genes, HSP genes. They have shown some of them showed only one or two or three, but this HSP27 was differentially expressed in all the four. So in heat, it is showing for 64 upregulation in tolerant. Similarly, for salinity, it is showing 24. In cold, it was showing 10 fold. And in drought uh, dehydration, it shows uh, 15 fold upregulation. So this is the way we have to choose the candidate gene based on the expression profiling. <laughs> Where is the tea? Uh, Snacks. We have to post you. <laughs> and then when it will reach, it will be ice cold coffee. Okay. <laughs> HSC, it will be ice cold coffee. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, uh, for your nice presentation. I'm sure students uh, at least uh, know how you can use these genomic tools uh, uh, to basically characterize a particular gene. And also, how you can do breathing. Uh, and also, he talked about this for the modern way of doing mutation and creating new terms. So, uh, thank you once again, Dr. Manoj. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, students. So, I think the next uh, you have a practical session, right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> So, in his, in his answers, I just wanted to say a few words about him. You have seen um, uh, his students are doing so good in their career. They have got so many different parishes. But I must tell you, Manoj is a very good friend of mine. I met him after I completed a master's. At that time, he was doing his PhD. I don't know whether you have heard about Dr. P.K. Gupta. He has a book. Right? He has published a book. So I actually was there for almost two months uh, doing some training work there, and I met him. Uh, there were a few other scientists, <coughs> those are non-scientists now, there were a few other students were there, one of them was Rajiv Bhashna. You know Rajiv Bhashna? Okay? So these friends, uh, they used to stay in the lab, literally. They, they actually rented a place. The place was basically to store their luggage. They didn't have any bed. They didn't have anything there. They used to stay in the lab for the entire five year period of their PhD because AC facilities were there. So they told me that, Nay Sumita ji, you don't want to go to home because AC is there. Lab may AC here, chair may so you will sleep. Okay? So morning 8 o'clock, short 8 o'clock, they will arrive in the lab because Dr. Piki Gupta arrives at 7.45 or 8 o'clock early. So before Dr. Piki Gupta arrives, they were always there in the lab. Okay, starting their day from 8 o'clock. So they will go, go back home at 4 a.m. morning. They take a shower. They take, uh, sorry, morning breakfast, that's a street food. Mostly street food, morning breakfast is street food. They come to the lab and they start working. At that time, they had one PCR machine in the lab. So they had to queue for it. So the senior fellow, like Manoj was senior research, senior PhD student, so he used to book it first. And the last junior, you can imagine, the one the guy who is doing my MSc, he has to stay the entire night waiting for the PCR. And the PCR needed a rest for one hour in between one reaction. 
So this is how these people worked at that time. Okay? And now that is the reason they are great scientists. Okay? They spent <laughs> maximum time in the lab, they studied, they did whatever they could in the lab. And their discussions was mostly about marker, gene, and lab, they gene, ko kya karna, usko kaise nikana. They never talked about anything other than their science. And also a little bit about politics. Everybody talks about politics, what is happening around the world. So I always tell my students, make this habit to be in the lab. When you are in the lab, you learn more. Okay? But when you are outside, you learn many other things. That is a societal thing. But if you are in the lab, you learn more. And there is a Sanskrit saying, I don't know whether you know, Kaak Cheshta, what that means is, you know the story of the crow who wanted to drink a little bit of water and the pigeon had a slice water, so he put stones there, you know, and then he drank water from there. So that is that should be your you know, way of working, Cheshta. Bako Dhyana, have you heard of uh, UFC? Okay, the Bako, right? It, it basically crane, it uh, catches the fish by standing there for almost one, two hours to get one meal. Okay? That kind of aim you should have. Okay, Kachishta Bako Dhyana. Swami, you know Swam? Dog? Have you seen? They don't sleep. They pretend to be sleeping. So as a student, you should not be sleeping really. Sleeping should be hardly two, three hours, not more than that. Alpohari, alpohari was not to eat less food. When you have your stomach, your stomach is full of food, then you cannot work. Griyadyagi, there is one word, Griyadyagi, you have to leave your home. That's, that's why, you know, you look into your Ramayana and Mahabharata, they used to go to the forest to do studies, away from their family. So your family tension is not there, your burdens are gone, everything is. You don't need to worry about your parents or children. Or so these are the things, characteristics of a good student. Bhaktishtha, Bhako, Dhyana, Swami, Nidra, Gathe, Vajra, Alpahati, Vriya, Dhyani, Vidyarthi, Cha, Pancha, Lakshana. Vidyarthi's five characteristics. So they were like that. And that's why they are successful. It's not only they, I have seen many international normal bond you talk about. You talk about Einstein, he was an anti-social person. He never went to any parties. He thought about I went to his place. I was lucky because my brother was there, his sister in university. I saw his house, a tiny little house, mostly books, and he used to read, he used to think. He didn't have the ability to talk to the people in a very nice way. Okay? That's why they are the new scientists. Just a source of inspiration. You don't need to be like that. I love any of her stars. I love her shows. So I do watch a lot of movies. I tell my students to go to movies also. Because that refreshes your mind. I, I read newspapers, I, I like politics, I like a lot of other things. I keep doing those things as well. But focus on this. When you're a student, you have to focus on the research and the uh, studies. Thank you. What do you have? What do you want me to wear? Yeah. Yeah.